Now we're coming into the period from 545 AD. This takes you to 556. But historically, the unit of time really needs to be considered through here. All right, that's 558. Because the event that starts in 545 has its culmination in 548, 558. And there's so much that happens in this time period <clears throat> that I'm sort of not sure how to cover it. So first I'm going to give you, as it were, the sweep, the outline, the grand picture. Okay. But first I, I got to tell you the text because that'll the, the, every single word in this, in scripture when it does the annual, it's telling you the flavor of the times. It's also, once you know that, you draw conclusions about where you ought to go, what you ought to do, what you ought to be. So, as it were, this period here from 545 to 558 is a process. God's pronouncement, diagnosis, prophecy, of course, of what that time will be like. So now I have to go through the words so you get, it's like a title for the time. All right, so what is that title? What is this text, first of all? The seven heads, seven mountains are. That's the literal Greek of each word. Chai hepta, kephale, hepta, hore, esin. All right. Asin is the plural uh, of to be. The seven heads, seven mountains are. Now, the word to be here in the plural. In our in our English translation, we'd say the seven heads, and then we skip over down here. Are seven mountains. That's what we'd say. We'd put, I, we'd put the verb to be in the middle of the predicate nominative here, which is seven mountains, compared to the subject, seven heads. Greek does that too, but here it's not. And when it doesn't, it's stressing the connection between the subject, seven heads, and the predicate nominative, which is seven mountains. It's stressing the relationship, the identity, the equating. Okay, this is really important. It's stressing the equating. So the subject is seven heads, and the and the predicate nominative, not an object, but uh, the, it's like an equal sign. That to be is kind of like an equal sign. When I say I am female, I'm saying something about the self. All right. So seven heads seven mountains are is saying the seven heads are seven mountains it's it's telling you something about the seven heads and in greek you could stick this verb isin in the middle or you can stick it at the end and in greek if you stick it at the end if you stick the verb at the end you're stressing the function all right and that's what's happening here. You're also stressing the relationship because this is the verb to be. You're stressing the relationship between the subject, seven heads, and the predicate nominative describing the subject, seven mountains. So the seven heads, seven mountains are. That sounds poetic in English, but it's not poetic in Greek. It's a stress on the nature of the heads telling you something specific about the heads. All right? And that matters because once we get down here after Justinian's dead, it says, and kings seven are. So you're finding out, okay, well, these heads have some connection to the kings who are also seven. It's not saying that the, the seven kings are the seven heads. It's not saying the seven kings are the seven mountains. This is really important. 
there are, you, you don't need that structure in Greek. But you have to say, and seven kings there are. There's a connection in identity, but it's not equating the kings to the heads. This is a mistake theology makes, okay? And you know that what I'm telling you is true because he's saying here five have fallen. One, that's the word for one, one of them, this is just a definite article, is. You notice he's, he's putting the verbs at the, at, the, at the end each time, okay? And the others, not yet. Hupo, that's what you say to your kids when they ask you if you're there yet at the destination. Hupo, not yet, will come. And others, not yet, will come. So the kings are not the same as the heads. And the mountains, of course, are not the same as the heads either, but, but the relationship between mountains and heads to help you identify the heads. All right? Now, I'm sorry to be so pedantic, but, but this is how the precision of the wording works. In order to get the meaning out of it, you've got to get into these weeds like this. All right? And the Greeks loved doing what I just told you. They'd love picking this apart like I'm doing because that's what their entertainment was. All right, so again we go back. This is 545. The seven heads, seven mountains are where? Hupo, this hupo, and not this hupo. Hupo here with the omega means not yet, but hupo, really, means is an adverb meaning where. Okay? Now, again, we still have to stay in the weeds because it's saying the seven heads, seven mountains are where. Now, in English and pretty much any other language, when you have a verb like, uh, an uh, adverb like where, it introduces what's called a subordinate clause. The subordinate clause is modifying the clause that went before. In other words, these are seven heads and seven mountains, and this is this is answering the question, well, where are they? Because that helps you identify the heads and the mountains. You got that? Where, and then the woman, but it means the whore, sits upon them. Okay? Where the whore, the woman, sits upon them them. And at the word upon, Justinian's going to die. That's 565. So this is 558 by the time you get where. Well, where is Justinian when he dies? Well, Justinian, when he dies, is at the place of the seven heads and the seven mountains. The seven mountains. This is such a killer. It, oh. It's like Satan is making fun of Christians. The Seven Mountains is a nickname, a very famous nickname for Rome. It's what the Romans in Italy called themselves when they first got started, before there was a Rome. Rome, the area of Rome is in western Italy. It's just like um, the lower upper, the lower left part of what we call the boot, but it's not at the bottom of the boot, it's just at the ankle level, okay? It was a swamp. And so in order to escape the noxious fumes of the marshlands of what was not yet Rome, just that area, there were seven hills that people lived on so they could get better air, all right? The people who were on those seven hills decided they were going to do something about that swamp land in, down below. And they built a port. Well, it's not really a port. They had to do a lot of building to make it into a port. But they wanted the river that was coming down and, and sort of going into the sea through this marshland to actually be commercially valuable. And so they turned it into 
what we call Rome. They lived on seven hills to get away from the noxious fumes because it's at sea, nearly at sea level. All right? So they called themselves patricians. They, they were all proud of themselves because they lived on those hills. And we're the high people, and we're the good people, and we're the elites. And these are the seven hills we lived on. And you can't live on my hill unless you marry into the family and be a patrician like me. That's what they call themselves, the seven hills of Rome. That's like saying the power seat, the important people, the only ones who matter, the elites, the guys who built Rome. And keep it going. The only people worth counting were the ones on the seven hills. Okay? Hore means a hill or a mountain. Okay? So what's so ironic and sad about this is that the people in the United States today who back Trump, sponsor a doctrine they jointly share. I'm not sure that they share it equally, but it's a doctrine they call the Seven Mountains. They call it that. All right, so they're reading Revelation 17 in exactly the opposite way. Because what does it say here? The seven heads, seven mountains, hills, are... Where the woman, the whore, sits upon them. Now, if you read this text, you're like, I don't want to be seven mountains because a whore sits on it. It's right plain here in Revelation 17. What, whatever the, the seven mountains are, they're dominated by religion. Dominated, that's an important word. Dominated by religion, which God always depicts as a whore ever since Jeremiah 16 at least. Okay, it's got a long etymology basically because in the old days, if you wanted to be close to God, you had to copulate with a temple prostitute. So that's kind of the etymology of this idea of whore being religion. All right, religion is a whore selling you something to give you a little thrill and then selling it to you again often that's religion for you god is anti-religion in every page of the bible and here you're seeing today's page seven mountains are where the whore the woman sits katete katetai Ah, e, katetai. A woman sits on the mountains, upon them. That's what the them is, right here. Of course, you could argue, well, then she's sitting on the heads, too. Yeah, religion is dominating them. Now, what's so pathetic about the seven mountains behind Trump, and you can Google this, go to YouTube, and, and read up on what they say their seven mountains are. It's seven mountains of domination. They think, they, they, I don't know, they, this is about a whore. God's calling religion a whore. And they think it's holy? How is that possible? So Satan has obviously got control over those people. And he's, he's like waving his hands back and forth. Like he's standing on a mountain waving his hands back and forth and say, see, 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 I'm sponsoring these people because they can't even read their own scripture. But they think they're godly. Yeah, and so does Justinian, Antichrist. The seven heads, seven mountains are where the woman is sits and at the word sits that's the last year of Justinian he ain't gonna be sitting there no more he gonna be dead he dies right here in November if I recall so he ain't sitting on those mountains here see them this is a word for them He's not sitting there. 
He's dead. Meanwhile, the woman is still alive and still sitting on those mountains. And the seven mountains people behind Trump right now think they'll bring Christ back if they pursue their seven mountains of domination, a.k.a. religion. And religion is the first mountain. I'm sorry, I shouldn't yell. Religion is the first mountain in their platform. Go look this up. I have been trying to tell people in the media, you got to be alert to this. This is where the history is going. And yeah, I'm getting it from prophecy, but you don't even need prophecy anymore. You just need to know what's happening now. Okay, the Seven Mountains people are behind Trump. They think they're they're Christian. They're going to bring Christ back before the 2000th anniversary of the cross in 2030. And guess what? In Russia, right now, as I talk, the Russian Orthodox have the same idea, except their version of it is much older. They call it the last emperor. It's the same idea as the Seven Mountains Christians. Exact same. Except it's got a longer history and more variations that you can look up. That's how I learned all this stuff I'm telling you. I didn't know this when I got started. I'm like, well, what's this year and what's this year and what does this mean? And that took me from one thing to the next thing to the next thing until I'm where I am now. And now I'm trying to pass it on to you. Seven Mountains is the, is the U.S. name for it. But the Greek name for it, which is the Russian name for it, because Russia thinks it inherited the Byzantine Empire when the Byzantine Empire was taken over by the Turks in 1453 A.D. They think they are the lawful and only right carriers of the word of God, which they wouldn't know if it bit them. And Putin is trying to play to their, what's called the last emperor myth. Okay? And that's their version of Seven Mountains. Because Seven Mountains is a nickname not only for Rome and Italy, but for the Byzantines. Because when Constantine built New Rome, a.k.a. Constantinople, a.k.a. Istanbul today, he created Seven he reproduced Rome in Italy in Constantinople, which he called New Rome, right down to the hills. He reproduced everything, okay, because he wanted it to be the New Rome. He didn't like the old Rome. He didn't like that marshland. And so the seven hills in New Rome had its own elites living on them, those seven hills. So seven heads. Yeah, every family, every clan is going to have a head. And they live on the seven mountains of New Rome. Constantinople, not Italy. Do you know how many millions of dollars have been wasted in theology? Saying, oh, well, Italy is going to revive and it's going to be the Catholics. That's what Calvin thought. But the text is plainly telling you here if you just counted your syllables. It's New Rome. There were two Romes. Everybody on earth knows that. Starting in 1330, there were two Romes. The second New Rome was dedicated in 330, seven years before Constantine died. And the seven heads, yeah, of a clan or of a hill, seven mountains, hills are, yes, yeah, seven hills of power. Seven hills of power. Kefali also means power and authority. And that's what the Seven Mountains people in the U.S. think. And in Russia, they call it by a different name, Third Rome. Because to them, the Second Rome, the New Rome, with its seven hills, died and they inherited the mantra, the mantle of the second Rome, and therefore Russia is the third Rome. And as I talk, there is a propaganda film about the second Rome, made by Russia, sponsored by the government, and especially by the clergy in Russia, basically urging Russians to rise up 
and B, the third Rome, and restore the second. In other words, make war on Turkey, because that's where Istanbul is now. Make war on the Muslims. Make war on the West, because it's all the West's fault that, that Constantinople fell with its seven hills. And then you'll be the new third Rome, and you'll be the heads and have the power. And, of course, Putin would run the whole thing as the last emperor. And then Christ will come back, and Putin will take off his crown and hand it to the last emperor. That's what's happening right now as I talk in Russia. The Russian Orthodox is like all over and they persecute any Christians who are not Russian Orthodox. And of course they persecute the Jews and of course they persecute the pagans and they persecute the gays. So the Seven Mountains people in the United States think that the Russian Orthodox are all so holy and Mike Pence just visited. A Russian cleric in Moscow might have been the Metropolitan of Moscow, who's the head priest. They're equivalent of Pope, except they don't they say they don't have popes, but they really do. Do you see where this is going? Putin is aiming to be the last emperor. It's an ancient Byzantine myth. It's also known by Pseudo Methodius, and it kind of starts well, I don't know if you could say it starts here, but in a way it does. It kind of starts here. You can argue it started with Constantine. That Christ will come back once we Christianize the world. That's the aim of the Seven Mountains people. That's the aim of the Third Rome Russian Orthodox. Once we Christianize the world. Okay, but we can't Christianize the world without an emperor because there's no such thing as church without emperor. That's a fundamental tenet of Byzantine theology, which is Russian now. So we gotta, we gotta have our seven, we gotta have seven heads and seven horns to be in order for Christ to come back, because we're all holy. And that's what the people in the United States who ascribe to the Seven Mountains Doctrine and they're backing Trump and telling him all this, that he's the anointed guy. Meanwhile, in Russia, the clerics, because they want the real power. See, because you have the real power if you're on the seven hills, the seven hills of domination, yeah. They want, they're telling Putin, or Putin's telling them, hey, I'll be your last emperor, and then we'll bring Christ back. This is a movement happening right now. A revival of Rome is being attempted. So do you see why I'm spending so much time on Justinian? Because the antichrists of today... Okay, and there are antichrists even if there's no rapture. That's the whole point of this passage. There's always antichrist. That was what 1 John 2 was saying. All right? There's always antichrist. And in the U.S., they're in the White House now. That's one of their seven hills. Government. I think it's the last of their seven hills. The first of their seven hills is religion. And hello, see, the whore sits on the seven hills. Yeah, and their first hill in their seven 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 mountains thing, because this means mountain or hill, is religion. But God's against religion, but oh, they don't know that, because it makes them feel holy if they crusade. And that's what's going to happen, honey, because the 2000th anniversary of Christ's death is coming up in 2030. That's why this period since 2000 has been so intense. 2000 is the, is the 2000th anniversary. I mean, it's really not the 2000th anniversary. It was 1997 was the 2000th anniversary of his birth. And then 30 AD will be the 2000th anniversary of his death. Because we, we, we got our AD wrong. All right. Well, I explained that in previous videos. It has to do with a guy named Varro in ancient Rome and the year that Christ was born. But... See where they're going? Oh, seven mountains, we're going to bring Christ back with religion. Yes, religion is the whore here, honey. And she sits on the hills, on all seven of them. And what, they, they don't have their Bible that they can't read this? Okay? So, that's the doctrinal meaning of this section. And therefore, it comes to specifically refer to Constantinople because... 
and the seven heads or seven mountains are where the harlot sits. Okay, well, the harlot ain't sitting. Well, you could argue the harlot's sitting in Rome because there's a pope in Rome at this time. But it's not political power, and it's political power that's being stressed. Political is purple, religious is red. Okay, even down, even to this day, in the Italy's colors. Okay, and what's even more, uh, what do you want to call it? It's it's Justinian's time, and he's the only emperor at this time. There are no emperors in the West. There's only a pope. Okay? So it's talking about Constantinople. But there is a whore sitting on the old Rome. But old Rome hasn't been a seat of government since, so oh, even you could argue during Diocletian's time. But definitely since 330. There hasn't been a government seat there. It's just, you know, got cachet from romantic memory. All right? So who's the whore sitting? Well, that's what this section of history is going to tell us. All right? Now, 545 to 558 is the period. So, hi, hepta, kev. Phalai. Hi, hepta kephalai. That's six. That's what's so funny about this. It's seven heads, but it's six syllables. He could have done something to make that seven syllables, meaning that they're sort of shy. They're not really perfect. They're just the number of man, even though there's seven of them. Ha ha. See how witty the Bible can be? And the seven heads, seven mountains are. Seven mountains means the elites, where the elites are living in Constantinople, and you could argue in ancient Rome. Okay, in 545, starting here. Rome, west, isn't exactly being headed at all, at least not by Justinian. I remember our boy took it over in 535 and 536. Okay, but 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 then we had the plague here, and just before the plague here, the Goths took back. Okay, well actually, um, no, well Belisarius took Ravenna there. That's on the other side of Rome, on the other side of the boat. And then they get hit with the with the plague. Wait a minute, no, 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 no. That's five four that this five forty. He grasped the power of the Ostrogoths, not just Rome anymore. He went to the other side by then. And then the plague started coming up from Africa. And 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 in this year, this is at 541 when the plague started to come up from Africa. At the same time, uh, Belisarius gets called called back, called back by by Justinian to fight the Persians because at the same point when he's grabbing Ravenna, see, Ekon means to grab and hold. Ha ha. When Belisarius is grabbing Ravenna and therefore ousting the 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 Goths temporarily. That's that's when that's when the assassinated Persia starts warring again in the east. So then Belisarius has to leave what he just conquered, so he's not going to hold it anymore. Ha ha. And then that's when the the plague starts in Africa. And, he, and when that same syllable, when the plague is starting in Africa, he's far away from it. That's a good news. But then, but then Justinian sends him to Persia, because the Persia is fighting on the boundaries of the Roman Empire in the east. And as usual, they're fighting over money. Okay. And it's off again, on again, and it's this city, and it's that city, because who should control it? Who gets to own the taxes that that city produces? Because the whole Middle East is making money on trade. It doesn't really have anything per particular that it sells. It has to get most of its goods from elsewhere. 
But what it's good at is all that trade has to go through it in order for the people from elsewhere to sell. So they make their money on trade, and that's what the Persians are fighting over. Wow, we want the taxes of this city. You think it's yours? We think it's ours. Let's fight over who gets to own the money in the city. And, of course, you know who loses. The people of the city. All right. And meanwhile, while well, that's 541 and 542, oh, now this the plague is moving up into the Middle East that they just started fighting over here. And now it's hitting Constantinople, and you'd think that would wise everybody up so they'd stop fighting altogether. But, oh, no, brief lull, because, uh, hello, your soldiers are dead. But they started up again the following year, and right here at 545. Our boy Justinian is facing a two-front war. Italy, of course, starting back, starting back, starting back, starting back right here. Italy started going back to the uh, to the Goths. So they were losing what they just gained. Because, you know, having grabbing something is not the same thing as grabbing and holding. You need the whole verb. Echo means to grab and hold. You see how clever God is here. Okay, well, they didn't hold. They laughed. Okay, and then and then a whole bunch of them died because of the plague here. And actually, it was occurring all in here. So by 545, you got the people who are left in Italy, and it was largely depopulated. Okay, we know that from Procopius and other sources. The people who are in Italy are well, you know, they're not doing too well, but but they're 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 independent of Constantinople. And then the same thing's happening in Persia, and of course the Middle East was ravaged by the plague too. So it's on again, off again, partly due to that. And partly due to the fact that that's how people fought war. They fight at one city at a time. They make a little treaty about that city, whoever won. And the loser would pay some money or other things. And, and then the winner would go back home. That's how they, they fought war in those days. Okay, well, here at the beginning, hi. <laughs> that's, what, that's how you pronounce it. Hi. Yeah, well, the people saying hi are in the north. This is the beginning of the Russians, okay? They're in the north, and they're a mix of all kinds of people. They're a mix of Scandinavian. They're a mix of Slavic. They're a mix of Germanic. And they're all pushing against each other. And some of those people are pushed south, and some of them just want to go south toward the seven heads. It's the Seven Mountains, which is a definition of Constantinople. Where? Where? Justinian is. The whore Justinian. And during this time is exactly when he becomes a whore, too. Worse than before. Hard to imagine, but it's true. Okay? So the people that are coming high here are going to be where Justinian is at the gates of Constantinople by the time Opu occurs. Okay? This is, this. It, it's just, these are like, uh, what do you want to call them? Slavs and Huns and um, not necessarily the Huns. Okay, we're not talking about, there, there are many different kinds of Huns. Another word for German. Um, and a whole bunch of, like, migrating tribes that fight with each other. But, oh, there's this city in the east and north, south of us. We're going to go there. So they start fighting. Now, they'd been fighting. This stuff had been going on for centuries, even in Augustus' day, you know, in 30 B.C. All right? This has been going on for a long time. But now they're converging on Constantinople. So what Constantinople did is like what ancient Rome did, except Constantinople is a little more cheeky about it. They buy them off. 
Justinian was particularly good at that because he's like, okay, you're this group of peoples and you're this group of peoples and you're this third group of peoples and the third group doesn't like the second group or the second group doesn't like the first group and so I'm going to be nice to all of you and listen to what you say and find out how much you hate each other and then I'm going to plant little stories or give you money to fight your other brothers and sisters that are where you are and stay away from me. That's exactly what he does. That's what Rome had started doing, especially Constantinople, since, you know, basically it was founded. But especially here. Wait a minute. So what are... Oops. Yeah, sorry, I dropped the keyboard. Um, what our boy Justinian is doing is he's playing the time-honored game of splitting your enemies so that they fight with each other. And then buying, you know, sending little gifts to some and sending gifts to the other. And, and that keeps them busy amongst themselves and away from him. But this is, this is why it's so biting. This 545, this 558. By 558, the end of Hupo, Hupu, Hopu, 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 Hopu. Where are they? That word means where. Where are these people? Well, they're here at the right at the gates of Constantinople. 558. It's the closest Constantinople ever comes to being taken over in its history at that by that point. Five five eight. So because he played the games that he does in five forty five, the people's finally ways it wise up to whoa, we'll see he's bribing all of us and playing games with all of us. So how much money does he have? Why don't we go where? he is and take it together and this year 558 there are three big four big things that occur the first I just told you those same tribes up in the north that are starting here because remember he's already got a two-front war on the east and on the west okay but the north he was buying off and playing against each other. And that's what they're doing again right here at high. But by the time you get to where, the last syllable where, where, yeah, they're right at the gates of Constantinople to, to, to overwhelm it. And they hadn't been taking care of those, not gates, but they're at the walls. There were three walls prior to the city itself as you know used its defense against ground troops and by the time that dark ooh occurs they're at the they're they're at those walls or nearly at those walls so one last time and now we're going to come back to Procopius because in the first video I did I said I think I know why he wrote that nasty book in the middle this is, 50, this is 558. In 558, they're coming to the walls. And so Justinian summons Belisarius out of retirement in 558 and says, please go fight these guys. And the only good troops that Belisarius had left, and he's an old man now, really old. I forget how old, I want to say like 80. So somebody really needs to make a movie out of this guy. He summons himself up anyhow, and Justinian had taken away everything the man owned, shamed him in front of his wife in the public. Theodora hated him. Of course, she's she's dead by this point. I'll, well, I'll get to that later. But she had shamed him, gave all of his money to his wife, who kept cheating on him. And yet he stayed loyal to Justinian. And has, so in the middle, when the book that Procopius writes called Secret History that's so scathing, he's, he's 
gotten disgraced. That's why Procopius wrote it. I bet you money. Because Procopius was really loyal to this guy, and this guy was really loyal to Justinian in spite of all that. And so Justinian calls him out of retirement at something like age 80. And Justinian's no spring chicken either. And Belisarius at that ooh in black assembles 300 troops to go fight the oncoming hordes of Slavs and some mix of Vandals and some mix of, of Swavy maybe and some Allens. Who knows? Allens are kind of far away, but who knows? And he goes with the 300 to fight them. Now, I don't know how much you know about the Battle of Thermopylae, or Thermopylae, depends on how you want to pronounce it. But that was the Spartans fighting the Persians. And that was back, I want to say, what was it, three, somewhere around 380 BC? Okay? I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% sure on the date. But I think that it was some, somewhere around then. I want to say it was um, before the Battle of Salamis. The Battle of Thermopylae, or Thermopylae, was the famous song of the 600. You've seen the, the George Gerard Butler movie of the, the 300. Okay, that's because they managed to take the superior and very numerous Persian army and make it have to go through this pass, they call it a defile, where where you got mountains on either side of you and it's like two or three or five pe people wide and you gotta go through it like going through a faucet, okay, or going through a pipe. And if you do that, even though you got a lot of troops, then a few people that are on either side of the hills can shoot down on you and pick you off. All right, well, that's what our boy Belisarius basically does to these barbarians who are nearing Constantinople is he herds them into a into a, a sort of narrow defile, a narrow passage, and then he picks them off with only 300 men. And he wins. He wins. Okay, but in that same year, 558, you got to win here against these northern tribes who have been bribed or fought against each other through intrigue by the Constantinople crown emperor and before that the Roman emperors in Italy okay and they're defeated here that's good but guess what that same year and I don't know yet if it's before or after but that same year you know what else happens an earthquake and the earthquake knocks down. Remember the temple that Estai Hall de Hall that Justinian built by 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 537. Oh, see how holy I am! I built a Hagia Sophia. Yeah, well, it it right here. Ooh, it falls down. Now, you have to understand, the Greeks, the Romans, and these people call themselves Romans, and they think like Romans, the same culture, they're very superstitious. So on the one hand, they got this victory they shouldn't have had against the invading barbarian hordes, and then their temple falls down. Their most sacred, you know, pride myself, pride myself, pride myself temple, it, the roof just kind of pshoot, caves in. But that's not all, honey. That same year, and I don't know if it's before or after, it's probably after, the plague comes back. Remember a plague that hid in the middle of Sophia? Could God be making it cuter? You're going to call yourself Temple of Sophia? Fine, I'll take it down here. And then remember at Fee, you got sick, Justinian? Well, how about you get sick again? Constantinople's hit with another plague. In the same year. So, okay, you had a victory against, uh, you know, all those northern guys that you kept playing off each other and finally didn't work anymore. 
And yeah, okay, that's, ooh, ooh, you had a victory over them. Ooh also means not, but, so don't, not, not, not to be all con self-congratulatory, because down goes the temple you prided yourself on. The dome. After 20 years, well, 15 after you build it, just fall down. So then God didn't like it. That would be the natural conclusion of these superstitious people and pretty much anybody else. Hi, it's supposed to be God's house, and it fell down. So either there's no God, or he didn't like it. And on top of that, at the fee right here, oh yeah, the bubonic plague that's coming out of the lands you just won in Africa right here while you're building that temple. So during the middle of Sophia, I'm going to hit you with the plague. And I'm going to do it again right here, all the same year. So that's how this period ends. And the seven heads, seven mountains are where? Yeah, where Justinian is. As the as the head of the whore sitting on those mountains, because he's the head of them. So who are the other six heads? Because all the, all the elites are living on the seven mountains of Constantinople. They're not living on, in, in Rome anymore. The elites moved to Ravenna. So there aren't seven hills in Ravenna. So this can only be referring to our boy Justinian. Because the elites moved out of Rome when Constantine did. And they moved to Ravenna. It wasn't better weather. So nobody who's anybody is actually living in Rome. In New Rome, yes, though. So this is referring to Constantine, honey. So he's one of the heads. There are seven heads. Upon the seven mountains, yeah, it's where all the rich people live that control the politics in the city. And he's one of them. So who's the other? We'll pick that up in the next increment.